for uh, the systematic decimation of ZAPU. And this obviously rhymed with a lot of what we saw being done to the NDC Alliance, especially uh, in the, the post-2018 um, phase. Uh, we also saw what uh, ZANU-PF did with Operation Muramba China, that violent episode uh, in the 2000s. We obviously saw the violent, um, you know, disruption to the property rights regime that took place also in the early 2000s. Uh, we also obviously had the horrific 2008 election where a significant number of Zimbabweans lost their lives. Um, we then obviously move forward to the period of the coup. And then shortly, uh, you know, after the election in 2018 on the 1st of August, as, you, as you've highlighted, you know, the unconstitutional arbitrary shooting murder of civilians uh, in the street in open and cold blood. To date, we have not had any accountability uh, from the regime, obviously, to try and save face. They, they set up or purported to set up a commission of inquiry whose recommendations they simply ignored. And to date, we have not had uh, any accountability in that regard. In fact, some of the, the perpetrators of those violent shootings were actually elevated and given ambassadorial posts. We saw the violence uh, in January 2019, when again, uh, you know, there was this unconstitutional arbitrary killing uh, by the military of citizens. Uh, again, to date, we have had absolutely no accountability for that. Then, you know, post that January 2019 period, we had a phase where there was huge persecution of the opposition. We saw a number of abductions take place. Uh, I'll just zone in on, obviously, the one that's uh, perhaps uh, the, the most horrific, that of um, Joanna Mamombe, Netsai Marova, Cecilia Chimbiri, to date there has been no accountability for the perpetrators of that uh, horrific crime. In fact, they are now being prosecuted um, on unconstitutional charges and being persecuted for bringing to light this egregious uh, crime, which was even condemned by the United Nations. We also have seen the systematic weaponization of the legal system against top leaders in the opposition, uh, you know, whether it was for showing up at Harvest House in the case of Tindad Eti, um, you know, uh, Ms. Karenyi Kore, Honorable Karenyi Kore, and a number of other leaders, uh, Gladys Khachwayo, Lav Mochinoputa, and a number of others. We saw the persecution that was uh, meted out against, uh, you know, Honorable Charlton Wende. We saw what took place with uh, Honorable Amos Chibaya. We have seen what's happened to a number. In fact, there was a time where almost every single leader uh, in the opposition of, of any influence uh, who was not connected to Mr. Monzura was in court facing some rather dubious charge. And of course, uh, obviously not to forget uh, Honorable Job Sikala. There was obviously no conviction, uh, except of course for the case of uh, Mako, uh, Makumborero Haruzivishe, but again, you know, the circumstances of that conviction are extremely controversial. Uh, the matter, of course, is subdued the case, so, uh, you know, I don't want to come in too much on it, but suffice to say that. Time may proceed. He was, uh, Marco was persecuted for clearly political uh, reasons. Uh, then now coming to, I think, what's most important for purposes of today's discussion was the abuse of not only the courts, but also state institutions to create this fallacy that Mr. Munzura was somehow the true leader of the opposition. Now, any constitutional lawyer, any basic student of politics and any citizen uh, who, you know, has a right to vote and has a right and understands that the will of the people is supreme, understands that it's not the courts that impose upon uh, the people a leader uh, of the opposition of any political party, it's the people, especially because, uh, you know, we work as a matter of law on the understanding that all political parties are voluntary associations. They're governed by their own rules and their own rules are supreme. And this was dealt with by the Supreme Court itself in the Mutasa case. Uh, but anyway, we saw this very unique and
unusual approach where the, the recalls that were effected by Mr. Monsora illegally, um, he simply had no power to effect those recalls if the law and the record is looked at, especially because it's beyond clear that all those representatives who got in on the back of the MDC Alliance in 2018 ran under an MDC Alliance ticket. And it's no secret that even the court petition that was before the Constitutional Court had it on record and it was acknowledged as a matter of both legal fact and, and law uh, that, um, you know, President Nelson Chamisa had been the, the leader of the MDC Alliance when the party contested in the 2018 election. But by some twist of honesty, twist of the record, twist of facts and abuse of the will of the people, we suddenly saw Kupe, who had run her own political party, who had actually conducted her own uh, Congress um, in the run-up to 2018, who had uh, ran against the MDC alliance, but also completely separated herself from that MDC alliance project. I think it's a matter of record uh, that she opposed even uh, Morgan Shangirai, as he led that initiative. Um, she had her own Congress, she started her own party, it was called the MDCT. They only managed to get 45,000 votes, whereas uh, President Chamisa got well over 2 million. And that's all a matter of record, but for some reason, all of that was completely ignored. And we were saddled with this very uh, strange, problematic situation where a leader was imposed on the people, Persons who were elected representatives were uh, unlawfully recalled. We then had a situation where Harvest House, which had been uh, the HQ of the MDC Alliance, was unilaterally taken with the assistance of the military. We then also saw just a number of persecu uh, uh, persecuting acts perpetrated upon uh, the opposition. Then, obviously, the, the proclamation was made at the start of uh, 2022 to the effect that there would be a by-election. Now, curiously, uh, even though they had effected those recalls, they had for some reason that is foreign to our law uh, banned the conduct of elections. Of course, COVID is not an excuse. We saw that uh, a number of elections were conducted under uh, COVID-19. We saw what happened in Zambia. We saw what happened in Malawi and a number of other jurisdictions, even South Africa. And you'd actually find Zanu PF leaders attending the inaugural Inaugurations, uh, you know, person to such elections, even though they're refusing to conduct elections here in Zimbabwe. Obviously, they're afraid, hugely afraid of the will of the people. But anyway, we come to January and the proclamation is made. And it's at this time that the people bit the bullet. And an announcement was made by President Nelson Chamisa on the 24th of January that a brand new political party, the Citizens Coalition for Change, uh, was formed. This party has new values, new principles, a completely new structure, a new constitution, a new mantra, new symbols, a new political objectives, completely divorced and separate and distinct uh, from the old MDC by whatever name called. And we essentially had less than two months to galvanize the citizens and just make inroads into electoral territory that had been typically dominated by ZANU-PF and the MDC. Now, anyone who studies the electoral landscape in Zimbabwe knows that it's very binary and typically uh, the citizens only vote for uh, ZANU-PF and at the time the MDC. So there was a lot of work and it was known uh, to the leaders of the Triple C, President Nelson Chamisa and the team around him and the people really uh, who had suffered this un onslaught and this uncon and who had been the, the victims of this unconstitutional conduct that there was a lot of work to be done. Firstly, to notify the people, the citizens, that there was this new baby. It had brand new colors, brand new insignia, brand new way of doing things. And to get the message across. And I think uh, it has to be placed on record that a lot of uh, groundwork had been done initially. Uh, you'll recall that President Nelson Chamisa went on a meet the people to, uh, to most provinces uh, at the end of 2021, just finding out from the citizens what they wanted to happen 
in the face of the onslaught uh, that uh, the citizens were facing against um, uh, by the regime. And the overwhelming response that uh, we received from the people was that they wanted something new and something new is what the people got on the 24th of January. But still, the message had to be sent across. So the by-election for us, its significance was firstly uh, to just let everybody know that there was a new baby uh, in the political marketplace. Secondly, it was going to offer an opportunity for the citizens to test the system and especially ZEX a readiness uh, to or, or capacity to conduct a free and fair election uh, for 2023. And I think it was made very clear on the 24th of January by President Chamisa that this was an appetizer. We wanted to test our systems, test the machine, see, you know, uh, you know, the, the, the impact of the new community consensus, um, you know, candidate selection program that we uh, rolled out to test people's awareness, whether the message was getting across that there was this new baby and we're trying to, you know, um, change completely the game when it comes to doing politics in Zimbabwe, uh, to, to have uh, an all-embracing movement where the citizens come first and are at the center of all decisions that are being made. And then also to obviously strengthen our own processes. I think we are all familiar with the challenges that were faced electorally um, in 2018 with the uh, limited number of polling agents, which made it extremely difficult to defend the vote. Now, in the lead up to the by-election on the 26th of March, um, the Triple C already was facing a huge onslaught by a very scared ZANU PF. They banned at least four of our rallies. We know that they banned us in Gokwe, they banned us in um, Marwandera, they banned us in Cholochi, they also banned us uh, in, in Epworth, although the, the courts later intervened with that. Um, obviously, there were bannings of other rallies, including one that was meant to be held in Harare, Eastern Tafara. And the regime was running scared. Political violence became ubiquitous, especially in the rural communities, especially in the Midlands, uh, which is considered by Mr. Mnangagwa to be his own homeland. We all saw what happened in Kwekwe, where an orgy of very primitive Stone Age violence was unleashed by ZANU-PF thugs uh, who were actually carrying, according to the police memo released by CID Law and Order in Kwekwe, uh, ZANU-PF cards. They came bearing machetes, stones, spears, and they actually um, struck Mboneni um, Nguwe three times in the back and he died on arrival um, at hospital. Uh, almost 100 uh, of our members were also injured. I think we all saw the, the, the images, the scenes. Uh, the Red Cross had to uh, come to the rescue following that orgy of violence. Only a day before, we had experienced extreme police brutality in Gokwe, where the police pursuant to this illegal uh, ban of our rally, um, started unleashing tear smoke, running dogs on the citizens and beating people with baton sticks. They used so many water cannons that the water cannons themselves, after people de were defiant, uh, ran out of water. Now, those colonial uh, forms of law enforcement were very disturbing to watch. You don't unleash a dog, a violent, rabid dog on a citizen just because they choose to believe different and hope for a better Zimbabwe. You, you, you don't strike a citizen because they choose to go and hear the message of hope by President Nelson Chamisa. That's simply not the sort of politics that will take Zimbabwe out of the quagmire it currently faces. We also had issues with the state media, ZBC completely distorting the message that was being delivered by, by the movement. They would lie that President Chamisa had said unleash violence when he'd said exactly the opposite, that we believe in the politics of peace and nonviolence. Um, we had the, uh, huge difficulties with the failure by ZBC, which is a constitutional obligation under Section 62 of the Constitution, uh, to give us 
fair and equal uh, coverage in state media. They simply refused to do that. Um, they would uh, broadcast Mr. Mangagwa in St. Mary's and then refused to broadcast Mr. Chamisa in, in President Chamisa in, in Epworth. Uh, and in all the rallies where I have to say, we experienced bumper crowds, record crowds. I mean, it's reported that the crowd that we had uh, at Zimbabwe grounds was, you know, so, so, so big that the last time anything close to that uh, was reached in that same venue was at Independence, the same in Sakuba, the same in White City in Wulawayo, the same in Mashingo. Time after time, the citizens were making it very clear by their numbers that they were keen uh, on change. The big challenge that we face right now relates to the integrity uh, of the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission, which we've said time and again must be disbanded. They produced on election day, and yes, of course, we won despite the odds, but it must be placed on record so that it's rectified in good time for 2023. A symbolic voter's role, a symbolic voter's role where a number of our uh, you know, supporters arrived on voting day only to find that their names were not in the voter's role. He had written to Zek prior to the election uh, complaining about this, and also uh, challenges were raised by individual candidates saying that's simply not on, that, you know, the voters' role, and we had been very uh, diligent about securing a copy of the voters' role as early as February, following all the procedures. And, you know, when we had given that voters' role to experts, I think Freeman Chadis here and a, a few others, um, to, to, to comb through, to look through, to analyze, as, as Zek, after being discovered and exposed, actually proceeded to fire uh, those uh, election officers who had uh, given us that voter's role because they were now being exposed. Uh, and yet that is the voter's role that they proceeded to use on, on the day, symbolic as it was. So in Epworth, for example, uh, you know, a number of thousands of people turned up uh, at the, the 84 polling stations and were simply not uh, there on the voter's role. Sometimes, uh, you know, a spouse wife would come, she would not find her name on the voters' roll, even though she'd voted at that polling station in 2018, the husband would come and find that his name was actually there. And so we can see that there's been some sort of unconstitutional uh, gerrymandering delimitation that they, uh, you know, carried out that resulted in the disenfranchisement of a significant of thousands and thousands uh, of citizens. We also had issues with our polling agents uh, being denied access to polling stations. We had issues around the, the integrity of a number of the presiding officers who, for example, would open ballast material and electoral material, uh, you know, without, uh, uh, you know, the candidates being present or being informed, which is contrary to Section 51 of the Electoral Act. Uh, we had a huge number uh, of um, um, issues around vote buying. This happened in Ward 41, for example, in Mabvuku, where there was huge vote buying, which is, uh, you know, contrary to law. Uh, we had the same thing in Epworth. We also had issues, uh, you know, with traditional leaders uh, abusing their power to intimidate, uh, especially those in more remote areas, including uh, Mutasa South, where you know voters would come, they would first arrive at the, the, the headman's uh, place, be given an agent who would escort them and watch them vote, and you know they had to return back, uh, you know, and return and show that they had voted for Zanu PF. And of course, uh, you know, we see the weaponization of food aid, uh, you know, in areas where, uh, you know, in the rural areas, because if you're not on the the, the list of the headmen, you simply won't get food. And that's what's being used to try and pull the vote for Zanu Pier. Uh, just tied to the, the rural vote, uh, we, we had a very interesting situation in Binga where our rally was banned. Uh, Mr. Mnangagwa, however, was allowed to go and uh, participate and have a rally there. He obviously, huge vote buying. He, you know, gave uh, bicycles to a number of uh, residents in Binga. Uh, and the people were defiant and uh, they voted overwhelmingly in support of the Triple C uh, candidate, candidate who was there, Prince Dubeko Sivanda. We had similar issues in Dangam and again, you know, an overwhelming uh, vote on, on, on the part of Triple uh, C. So, in short, 
we have a lot of work to do. Uh, obviously, we thank the citizens very much for their huge vote of confidence and for the landslide uh, victory that we enjoyed despite the odds. I mean, we received 19 uh, out of 28. We won 19 out of 28 uh, of the available seats. Uh, for the parliamentary elections, and I think over 70 uh, in by-elections, and th this is huge, you know, well over about two-thirds in both scenarios, especially for a two-month-old baby that was robbed of all its party funds. I should have highlighted that all the money that was due uh, to us in terms of the Political Parties Finance Act was unlawfully uh, taken away, despite there actually being a court order in our favor. Uh, but with no funds, the citizens funded their own struggle with no time, with no resources. You know, the citizens defied the odds. And I think the, the clear message for 2023 is that the Citizens Coalition for Change can and will certainly win an election that is free and fair. The big fight at the moment is around electoral reform. And this is something that was highlighted in great detail by President Chamisa in his uh, citizen agenda speech for 2022, when he said, you know, the citizens, we really have to act for change. We have to do all the heavy lifting to ensure that we defend the vote uh, for 2023 and ensure that ZEC does what they're supposed to do. If they can't act constitutionally, if they can't act lawfully, if they can't act with integrity, if they can't be honest, if they can't do the basic administrative task uh, of producing a voter's role and registering voters, then they must be disbanded. You know, you can't hide a polling station in the middle of a bush just because you know it's a stronghold of uh, the, 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 the triple C candidate. You can't, uh, you know, gerrymander voters' role just because in areas where you know, uh, you know, the triple C candidate is strong. That's not the sort of politics, uh, you know, that will take Zimbabwe into the future. The citizens are sick and tired of suffering, and I am rounding up. Uh, but I just want to say that, you know, with 49% extreme poverty, a return to triple digit, a triple digit hyperinflation, two billion, over two billion being looted by Zanu PF every single uh, year, a uh, hundred million is lost to illicit gold deals every single month, teachers are underpaid, our health, our public health system is on its knees, the state of our schools is deplorable, nothing works, everything is collapsed, they consistently interfere with local authorities to a point where, you know, they've completely hamstrung their operations and, you know, impeded the delivery of basic services. Our road networks are a complete national disaster by their own admission, and notwithstanding that they've got the obligation in terms of, uh, you know, the Roads Act uh, through Zanata to fund, to properly fund uh, two local uh, authorities and road authorities the, the fixing of these roads. They've got an obligation in terms of the Water Act uh, to ensure that water potable would waters delivered to citizens, but instead they're on a crusade of uh, building uh, or sinking boreholes for political gain. No, Zimbabweans deserve potable clean water. That's a basic right in 2022. So, Um, Ailoi, can you check what has just happened? Ineke? Hi, um, um, yeah, just, yeah, I think like we just lost wrong. Let's just see uh, Fadzi. Um, let's hope that she'll be able to, to come back in and to give uh, the opportunity to finish. But I think she my paints... Um, apologies. I think my, my big fingers uh, touched something. But I was just rounding up uh, and going to say that by all accounts, uh, ZANU-PF has failed the people. And the big task is to fight for electoral reform so that we don't have another disputed election uh, come 2023. And finally, Zimbabweans can enjoy a life of dignity, a life where they've got freedom, fairness and opportunity. And also where, you know, the will of the people is supreme. That's what was fought for in the liberation struggle. One man, one vote. And we want to finish the important business of liberation so that with independence, we get freedom as well. Thank you very much. Thanks, 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 Fadzi. And um, I think the picture you paint uh, is quite dire and uh, a bit deflating, I think, for, for those who are hopeful that uh, Zimbabweans can find themselves, find each other and sort uh, 
uh, the mess that the country is in um, as we move, especially towards 2023, that there will be less contestation of the electoral result. Um, and we have seen these things in 2018. Uh, we are now in 2022. There has been no movement in terms of reforms, in terms of um, uh, doing what has to be done to ensure that uh, there is less contestation of an electoral outcome. Uh, so, so it's it's quite um, yeah, it's quite a tall order, as you put it, uh, to begin to think of what has to be done between now and 2023 to ensure that uh, the electoral playground is uh, level and that uh, everyone has a chance. Um, you, I, I, I know that you'll come back at some point. Um, we know that the Zimbabwean crisis has ceased to be just a Zimbabwean crisis. Uh, it has spilled over into the region, into many other countries, and it, it has become an electoral issue, uh, particularly uh, in South Africa, and I think in Botswana, we have had statements from uh, mayors and ministers in Zambia that indicate that uh, the Zimbabwean crisis has stopped to, to being just a Zimbabwean crisis. It is a regional uh, domestic issue in many countries. Uh, I want you to come in and uh, at some point uh, tell us what uh, the region has to do uh, and um, uh, the international community at large, but particularly uh, the Sadak region, what needs to be done from their angle, even as you, those that are inside Zimbabwe, uh, do everything within your power to ensure that uh, there is less contestation uh, of, an, of a result in 2023. But thanks for, for giving us uh, uh, that background and also uh, what happened and the challenges that you are facing. And just to say congratulations on what looks like a solid win for you uh, in the by-elections. Um, I want to quickly come into, come to Freeman and say, look, uh, Freeman, you, you, you hearing for there, and the picture is quite uh, dire, but I know that uh, uh, you have been working on the electoral uh, uh, field in Zimbabwe for quite some time, uh, particularly on the technical side of what has to be done to try and ensure that, um, that the will of the people is perfectly reflected in an election outcome and that uh, ultimately it is respected. We are coming from a by-election, which I know that you have been following intensely, but also uh, feeding on the work that you have been doing in 2018 and before. What lessons are you drawing uh, from this by-election? And as we move towards 2023, uh, where should uh, all the pro-democracy forces be focusing on to be able to ensure that uh, uh, these uh, issues of election rigging and everything else either are overwhelmed or uh, they are minimized? Um, the issues of um, the voters' role, I think you have done a lot of work around the voters' role together with many others. Uh, where are we in terms of all these things? And in, in short, what must be done? So Freeman, can you quickly come in and um, take us through some of the things that you are picking? Um, thank you so much, Munjodze. I, uh, I don't know if you can hear me well, because it's raining here so bad. You are quite clear, my man, very clear. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, thank you to everybody that is here, and thank you, Shelo, for giving us this opportunity. Right. Um, you know, I was listening to Fadzi, and um, I'm, I'm sure that everyone who is listening understands now, you know, the complexities that are, you know, that are prevalent in Zimbabwe. And, um, I, I hope, as, as I articulate the issues that we have seen in the country, more and, people will, more, and more people will begin to also appreciate uh, how tough the terrain is in our country. Um, first of all, let, let, let me just go back to 20, 2018, uh, when it was the first time that actually Zach gave us the voters' role um, in, um, in digital format. 
we we had managed previously to have other voters roles um you know they could just give it to us in printed format so it was hard uh, and uh, you know they had to be compelled to to provide those, that voters role uh, and they gave gave it to to us in printed format it was hard to analyze and we had to use um you know different technologies to extract the data now in 2018 they gave us a voters role that was digital which they said it was a bvr uh voters role that obviously we expected it to be unique uh given that we are talking about the uniqueness of um you know uh, fingerprints um when we looked through that voters role we saw a number of anomalies um actually we we managed to force zek to um, revisit and <laughs> edit the voters row three times before the election. That was in 2018. However, there were issues that were really apparent that they, they chose to ignore or to trivialize. Now, I'm going to touch on, on some of the issues that we found. There were about between 500,000 and um, 1 million voters that we failed were not legit. The reason why we failed that is because as you go through the voters' roll, there are things that you look at. First of all, we know how the ID, um, the national identity card of Zimbabwe is structured. We know that how to validate it. You know, we use uh, what we call... Um, a mod 23, modulus 23, to, to validate that ID. And we could see that there were a number of IDs that were not valid, one. Two, there were a number of people that shared, I think there were like 200,000 people that shared the same first name, the same last name, the same date of birth, and... Um, <laughs> um, the same uh, six or seven digits of the of the ID, except the last digit. Now, uh, I gave an example. I actually posted this on Twitter, uh, where we had somebody called um, Chenamo. Uh, she was called Swongile Chenamo. So we had we had two Swongile Chenamos. They were both female. They were born on 2nd of October 1990, both of them. And their IDs, both of them were 03-140190. Uh, these, both of them, and both of them had a Z, except the other one was Z03 and Z26, which means that they, you know, the, the districts of origin, I think, were the ones that uh, they were different. And, and these, these were unique. These are things that we could tell that this was wrong. And we approached Zek with about 200,000. We, we actually put a sample of about uh, 100, but we had 200,000 of those. We went to Zek and said, these people, um, we would want to make sure that they are legit people because this is statistically improbable. And they said, no, these people exist. And we tried to follow up on some of these people. We couldn't find them. Now, what happened in 2022? These people that we had identified, now they removed the duplicates in 2022. But in 2018, these people were there. They removed the duplicates only on the hundred people that we had asked about. They did not remove the duplicates in the other 200,000 that are still in there. Why am I saying this? There is a clear um, <laughs> conspiracy that is happening at ZEC, um, and, and people have to know about it. Now we get to 2022, they give us the, the voters' roll. We went through the voters' roll. Now, there were 177,000 people that had been moved from their polling stations, and Apparently, most of them had not applied to be moved. These people moved to polling stations, some which were five kilometers away from where they, they are, some to different constituencies, some to different wards. And this 
these people of these people, they had voted at these polling stations from 2008, 2018, 2018. But now in 2022, these people have been moved to a different constituency or to, to a different um, ward. And, 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 and none of them had applied for that. Those were about 177,000 people. We... We asked Zeke about this, and then they came back to us like Fadzi um, said. They said, um, we, we got the wrong voters roll. But this is a voters roll that uh, CCC had gotten from Zeke. And we asked them, how then do you say this is a wrong voters roll? There is a paper trail, and there, there, there are people that, they, that signed for this. They fired, they said, they fired people that were in the technical department and so forth. Um, but now, when you look at what you see in, the, in this voters' room, you realize that, from my belief, and uh, one that is shared by all those that have looked at this voters' room, Zach released a delimitation voters' row that they had already started to work on um, gerrymandering way before there has been a census and uh, way before there has been a, a complete, again, registration of people um, as is required by, by, by the law. And so, unfortunately, they, they gave that to us. And when we looked through this, there were certain trends that we were seeing. For example, like I said, you, you would realize that um, before this election, I said to to people, I, I think we shouldn't go into this election. The reason why I said that is because when you look through what Zeke was doing, uh, especially in Epworth, Kwekwe, um, and um, a number of other constituencies, especially around Harare, you would see that Zeke was specifically looking at polling stations and they were moving polling stations in a manner that would enable them in 2023 to gerrymander and provide a bigger chance for ZANU-PF and Mr. Mnangagwa to win more constituencies around urban areas. This is important. Um, let, let me zone in on, um, on Epworth. Epworth has uh, seven wards. Um, one to seven. Uh, and um, these words, you'll find that um, CCC did particularly well, particularly well in ward one and two. And Munangagwa managed to do better. They, you know, he was beaten by Chamisa in all the words, but Munangagwa managed to do better in the other words, four, five, six, um, and seven, than he did the other words. And so what Zeke was doing now was to move more people, uh, more people were moved. Um, the polling stations that Chamisa won well, they moved them um, to one area. And then the polling stations that Munangago won well, uh, no, 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 we lost with a, a, a better margin, they were moving them to one side. Now, you, you, you could see the people that were being moved there. Why is this important? The delimitation is coming, right? They are supposed to do a delimitation for 2023. And what is happening is that when you look at the constitution, the, the delimitation um, of Zimbabwe, we have 210 constituencies, and they are supposed to be equal in number. And, and there's a provision that says they should be, um, you know, not, not one constituent should be have more than 20% the number of any other constituents, which means when we talk from a statistical uh, standpoint, that's the mean, um, uh, the mean average, um, the med, uh, which is 10% up and 10% down. Uh, what that means now is that there is a huge possibility now that a number of rural uh, constituencies are going to be lost. From our projections, I think there are going to be about, uh, I think about 40, 
47 constituencies that have lost about 25% of their voters um, currently. And those, most of them are rural constituencies. And we also project that in Harare itself, it's going to gain about 12 new constituencies. These constituencies are around the areas of Harare South, Epworth, and Gourmont South, Akwazana, and, and, and up there near Glenview and, and Glenora. Those, those are the areas where they are going to gain new constituencies. So for Epworth, for example, Epworth is 70,000 70, registered voters, and we project that it's going to have about 83,000 registered voters by 2023. And um, by on average, every constituency should be between uh, 24 and uh, 30,000 uh, voters. So Epworth is going to have about three constituencies. Now with this gerrymandering that I'm talking about, there are going to be three So ZANU PF is trying to then, um, you know, balance the rolling. Then they should win them somewhere. And this gerrymandering is where things are happening now. And we have to pay attention to that. So I'm going to stop here, but there is a lot of information that is um, around the voters' role. Um, you asked me what should be done. I, I don't know if I have time uh in this lot now yeah you, you do have a few more minutes man you can get into that. <laughs> all right <laughs> so the first thing that i uh, i've been saying is that pay attention pay attention to a number of things number one zanu pf is a parent to um, you know, to drop sting, uh, sting bombs on one end while they are doing other things on the other end. So they occupy your attention in one corner um, while they are doing things in another corner. So, number one, the lawyers have to, first of all, pay attention to the constitutional requirement that all constituencies should be equal or they shouldn't be, you know, 20% difference, more than 20% difference amongst them. They have to pay attention to that now because from our intelligence, Zach, uh, Zach's own uh, interpretation of that is, is that they should be 20% up and 20% bottom, and therefore they should be a range of 40%. Uh, they, our, the lawyers should read this and they should make sure that this constitutional provision is really, um, you know, we, we, we stick by it. Number two, the delimitation. We have to focus on how the borders are going to change. This is important, again, when you look at Harare South. Harare South is only one award and 80 something thousand we project that is going to have 90 92000 voters it has one word just one word so what is going to happen is zek because zek is required then that um it has to create um words that are equal across the board or again you use that 20% that i was talking about now, so which means that the, administra the administrative boundaries of wards are going to be different between the, 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 the administrative ones and the ZEC ones. And probably what I foresee is that they are going to create more wards in, the, in, the, in, in Arari South. Uh, they are going to create more wards in Epworth, uh, in Goromonzi, and so forth. This, again, 
we have to pay attention to as the dynamics, the power dynamics are going to change, especially in councils. That's that's important for 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 control of local authorities. Number number three, we we have to pay attention again, um, especially CCC. I keep saying this. We had an issue in Chitunguiza uh, Ward 19 and 21, where we had two people, we had um, a candidate in Ward 21. The, the candidate's house, we could tell from the coordinates, we actually sent someone to go and stand at the house and send us the coordinates from the house. The house is clearly in Ward 90. But this ZANU PF candidate, went and contested in Ward 21. Now, when you look in the voters' room, there are four people that stay in this house. Two of them are registered in Ward 21 and two of them in Ward 19. But the house is in, when you look at the, um, uh, you, you look at the maps that Zach, provide, uh, the, the, that Zach provided, um, and you, you, you map that on, on geological maps, and you, you can see the house that it's in Ward 19, but the candidate contested in Ward 21. That's that, that's a clear violation, something that could be challenged. So these are things that we have to pay attention to because we have seen again voters that are in other wards now are allowed to, to vote in another wards, in, in other wards, in a way that would enable again ZANU to, in its uh, endeavor to control the councils. So we have to pay attention to those things. The last thing that I want to say is that we have the um, the responsibilities that um, you know the the individual voters have. Individual voters have the responsibility to register to vote. They have to show up to vote. They have to protect their vote. When we say protect your vote, stay at your polling station. Ensure that um, by the, the time the results are out there, they are posted out there. You send them to, to you know, to whoever is collecting. We're actually building systems to, to collect, um, uh, real-time collect those results. Uh, and also to secure your vote. I'm not going to speak about how you can secure your vote, but it's important. We, we saw an attempt to do that in, 29, in 2018, and people were shot, but we have to secure the vote. Um, the, the, the other thing that I would want to, to, to say at this point is that um, we, we are fighting a monster that doesn't really give a damn uh, what we think you know they don't give um let, okay no let, let me not say it they don't care about anything else except power and every day they wake up to dream about power they have institutions that are built to do this they have the MID, they, they have the military intelligence, they have CIOs, they have all these institutions that are dedicated to ensure that power is, is you know, they, they, they sustain their grip on power. It's not a game. And I wish everybody understood that we are dealing with an octopus that has got so many tentacles and is willing to kill to get power. So we have to do everything in our in, in our power also to 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 change that. Uh, for now, I'll stop here. Thanks, thanks, uh, thanks, Freeman. Uh, I think that's quite important, and a lot of uh, numbers uh, that people need to really think through. And I think that those that are in the election process, uh, as you put it, uh, need to become very friendly. Uh, with these numbers and develop uh, uh, some eyes on looking at some of these issues that you are pointing. I think it's quite quite important and they need to uh, to be factored into what we are seeing on the ground. Uh, Ellen, uh, Fazi and Freeman have just painted uh, a sad picture of um, the state of affairs in Zimbabwe regarding the electoral issues. Um, and the election processes. I know that as ESNI, you have been monitoring elections since 2000. Um, are some of these issues um, credible? Uh, 
do you as Zesni think that uh, the current state of affairs in the electoral processes from what you are gathering as you observing elections across the country uh, really do impact on the expression of the people's will and that ultimately the people of Zimbabwe have been shortchanged. What we're trying to get to understand here is that how do we build our election processes so that the will of the people is reflected uh, and what Freeman and what Fadzi have just said um, indicate that uh, there are many loopholes that will not allow uh, the free expression of the people's will. And as Zesni, uh, tell us what you have been finding, but also your take on the just ended uh, 20, uh, 22 by election and uh, your interactions with Zek uh, in terms of uh, your, your recommendations, the improvements that need to, to be made. What has been the attitude? Freeman talks about um, uh, the pro-democracy movement uh, dealing with an animal that is, uh, he says, a monster that is willing to kill to retain power. Uh, what has been the attitude as Zesni as you try to interact with state institutions that deal with elections uh, to try and ensure that the election process is as smooth as is possible? Ellen? Okay, uh, Ellen? Uh, thank you. Yeah, can you hear me, Mijon? Yes, I can. I can hear you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, for those uh, insights, questions. Um, yes, I, I totally agree that uh, there are issues, there are concerns uh, that have been raised by the two former speakers that I agree with. But um, one thing we need to be clear of as, uh, as Zimbabwe is that uh, according to our constitution, according to our laws, constitution in particular, the supreme law, um, the, the chosen way uh, or what we voted for during the referendum as a way of uh, choosing or selecting our leaders that govern us is through elections. So either way, we have to have elections as Zimbabwe, as a multi-party democracy or a growing or a country that is maybe trying to move towards um, a democracy. Uh, we are not a, a, a one-party state. So the fact that the constitution recognizes that we are a multi-party state it means that there is need for citizens to exercise their rights to vote for any political party they, that they wish for, to vote for, to also associate with any political party. These are fundamental freedoms that are already provided for in the constitution. And also in the different um, regional, international, continental instruments that Zimbabwe is a part to. SADAC principles uh, governing the conduct of democratic elections. We have the ACTEC. African Charter, Democracy and Elections and Governance. We have uh, UDHR, we have uh, the African Charter on People's Rights and so forth. There are quite a number of, of instruments that we can refer to, but that Zimbabwe actually signed or that Zimbabwe is, is a part two. So um, over the years, we have noted a, quite a number of issues in our elections, like you said, since 2000. Uh, though I joined this in a, a, a bit later than 2000, but the uh, way I used to work, we also were involved in elections. But what we have noted, um, piecemeal reforms, incremental reforms over the years. If you recall, we used to have the Electoral Supervisory Commission. And then if you read the reports that were produced in 2000, 2002, by organizations like Zessin, uh, there were also some organizations like Zim Rights, that you're also observing the also church organizations. If you read the reports, you realize that there were some recommendations that were made, there were observations that were noted and recommendations that were made uh, with regards to a number of uh, administrative electoral processes in a bid to strengthen our electoral processes. We used to have um, the delimitation commission. Uh, Freeman spoke about the need to critically look at the delimitation process, which is a very uh, um, a true um, observation. It's very important for citizens to 
election organizations like CSIN to monitor, to observe the delimitation process, and also to engage with citizens before the process uh, um, um, is undertaken and try and have citizens uh, be provided with information so that they can meaningfully participate in the process. Um, we also used to have, if you remember, the registrar of voters, it is the voters who used to deal with the registrar, General, uh, then Mudede. We also used to vote in two days. We used to use uh, our wooden boxes. We also used to, to have um, uh, results uh, being centralized in terms of counting. There was it was counted at a central uh, command used to call command center at constituent level and then at the national command center, the ESC then. So a number of reforms because of election observers, regional, international, and even local observers. We have seen a number of reforms, but we are not here today as Zimbabwe. There are still a number of reforms that we need to really critically consider and implement as a country. I will also fast forward to 2018. In 2018, the government of Zimbabwe invited a, quite a number of observer missions to come and observe our elections. If you recall, uh, organizations or emissions like the European Union had last observed the elections in 2002 in Zimbabwe. But in 2018, the mantra of uh, free and fair election, I think it was now more of a slogan of the, of the president and even the, the candidates that were also campaigning for the incumbent party. There was talk, a lot of talk about uh, free and fair elections. And uh, they invited these observer missions. There was Commonwealth. Hi, Ellen. We we seem to be losing you. So we, I think we have just uh, lost Ellen. Uh, so Solomon, very quickly, can you get in on the same questions that I had posed to? to Ellen, and then we get to a session where we allow a few people to come in uh, uh, solo. Are you in? I also think that we don't have, uh, we don't have solo. Okay, uh, Ellen, can you hear me? Oh, that's good. Uh, Fadzi, let me quickly come back to you. That, uh, so, so, so it's quite clear that there are serious, uh, serious issues that uh, are coming out in terms of the electoral um, playing field and the challenges that we are, we are seeing. Uh, and also the questions I posed earlier. I'm hopeful. 23 can be uh, a better year in terms of uh, ensuring that the environment itself is quite okay. Others have said that uh, it could be that you have not been doing enough as opposition parties in Zimbabwe in terms of uh, doing the need uh, or what has to be done. That uh, we are coming from 2018. Uh, we all saw the challenges that came with 2018. Uh, we knew what needed to be done. Uh, maybe you could have pushed more. Uh, is that too harsh and uh, uh, made by people that don't understand the context? Or do you think that um, uh, there is more that you can do uh, as a party, but also moving forward? Uh, one of the things is also that the, the, the kind of uh, voter path we saw in the by-election a lot of uh, people have been writing that it is because um, there is a lot of negativity. People are fed that the election result doesn't really matter. Uh, how do we deal with that? How do we ensure that we agitate people to want to participate in the election process, but also that it, uh, it has to do with their future? Just uh, come in very quickly and give us your thoughts around that. 
Thank you so much, um, Mungjodzi. I'll try and be brief. Uh, the whole reason that I painted the, the picture that I did earlier on is for people who maybe, uh, by reason of the fact that they're perhaps divorced from the context and also maybe uh, aren't aware of the, the uh, exigency of the struggles that the opposition has faced over the last uh, couple of years so that they can understand the sort of devil that we are dealing with. And obviously I use that term advisedly. Uh, you know, this is a very sophisticated dictatorship that will do anything to cling on to power. And I think Freeman uh, made reference to this. Um, and so the fact that our outfit is still standing despite all this, and that something new was able to be born, I think is a testament to the fact that we are doing everything we can in the toughest of circumstances. In fact, when I spoke, I didn't even go into uh, the individual challenges one will face, the fact that you're constantly in court uh, for, for very silly charges, flimsy, that they can't even sustain for 15 months, you don't get a charge sheet. Uh, you know, the, the fact that they will constantly persecute an attack. But that is not to say, Mungjodzi, that the room for improvement can never be filled. And the whole reason that the Triple C was created was to offer, you know, a, a new perspective and to really uh, bring citizens together and marshal our in imagination and all our, you know, best minds, our best ideas, you know, the, the best of the Zimbabwean spirit to, to build something big and something beautiful. You know, we want to launch off the politics of hope not the politics of despair. We all know what's wrong, especially if you're in Zimbabwe, but we want to defy these odds. Uh, and I think the citizens have been very good over the last couple of years at defying the odds. They thought that they'd completely destroyed us and that they had put in their own proxy pu puppet as the so-called leader of the opposition. But the citizens spoke very forcefully about what they want. It is possible uh, to, to beat this monster. And I don't think, uh, you know, uh, all the citizens, the thousands, the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of uh, citizens that we saw on the campaign trail, in fact, it's probably more than hundreds of thousands if we put all the rallies together, the millions of Zimbabweans that we saw, I don't think they would put that much effort into the machine, into the project, into, you know, 2023, if they did not believe that change was possible. People certainly believe. And we're obviously not naive uh, at uh, about the enormity of the task at hand. There's lots of work to do. Uh, Freeman spoke about some of the things. There are things that we're strategically working uh, around, things that I'm not actually going to go into detail about here because we know that we're dealing with a gruesome uh, regime. And if you unveil every single thing, say this is the actual litigation we're going to bring. This is the actual, you know, homestead we're going to use. This is, you know, they have been lethal in the past and we've learned it's not the first time that we're using the legal system, uh, you know, to fight the regime. So I think we've learned some lessons and we're going to launch off those lessons. I come now to the question of voter apathy. Now, if you look at the data, it will actually tell you that for by-election, the turnout that we had on the 26th of March was pretty standard. In fact, just a little bit above um, the norm. Uh, typically, you've got about 20% or just under 20% turnout. And I think this time it was a bit higher, close to the, the 30%. And if you look at some of the, the constituencies where we did very well, Nangamboro, for example, uh, we pulled uh, you know, over 13,000 votes. Being a rural constituency, we got over 10,000. The list goes on. It, it is clear that we had a decent turnout. Now, the reason statistically why Zimbabweans don't typically come out uh, for by-elections is because the citizens are really keen on, you know, participating in an election that's going to answer the national question. That's actually going to bring change to the table. Uh, and now, obviously, this by-election was extremely important for all the reasons I highlighted earlier. It was never going to be the sort of 
election that was going to transform the configuration of parliament. We're not going to be able to attain our desired goal of a two-thirds majority in parliament through this by-election. It also wasn't the sort of election where we could fully take control of all local authorities. So just based on that, some citizens would say, you know what, I'm waiting for 2023. And if you look at the turnout uh, that we had in the last general election, it, I think it gives us a better sense uh, of, of the turnout to expect. And if you look at uh, the changed mood in the nation is pretty clear that the citizens are anything but apathetic. And I was able to, uh, on the campaign trail, travel throughout all the provinces. And I think it's very clear that there's a changed atmosphere in the country and people are politically charged, ready to participate and so on. That said, obviously, there's a lot of work to be done around voter registration. Constitutionally, the obligation to register voters rests with ZEC, which has obviously been acting, uh, you know, unconstitutionally for all the reasons that I've pointed out. They're not keen on bringing out the vote. So we do have a lot more work to do. And as far as mobilizing uh, voters to go and register, we've got a, a lot of work to do uh, in terms of galvanizing the youth vote. And we are currently strategizing around that. Um, that said, it's every single citizen's obligation together, uh, you know, that we make sure that all the people around us have their ID cards. There's currently a blitz that's taking place nationwide in all provinces where, you know, uh, the, the ID card crisis is, is sought to be dealt with. So we must encourage each other. We're constantly putting out the information of where you can go and so on. Please make sure you go and get your, your ID card if you've just turned 18 uh, or above. Uh, following that, make sure that you register to, to vote. Uh, all it takes is proof of residence and your national ID card or passport, not your driver's license. So we are pushing uh, those messages. And obviously, uh, the critical task is to, to speak a message that wins the hearts and minds of the people. And our message is anchored on hope. We want to bring back, uh, you know, a style of doing politics that puts the citizens, the people first, you know, whether it's in matters of service delivery, whether it's uh, in policy formulation, the economy, the health delivery system, the people must have a say in how they are governed. You don't just go and, uh, you know, sink a borehole in a community. What if they want tap water? Deliver tap water. That is your constitutional obligation. That is your obligation in terms of the Water Act. Uh, you know, when, when citizens need public transport, you don't just go and uh, loot and buy Zuko buses that are privately owned and purport to hire them out. You build a transport system that actually works, uh, you know, for the citizens and they participate and everything is transparent. That's the kind of politics that we want to build. For us, the 2023 election is not just uh, you know, about having an election for the sake of the election. It's about bringing transformation that a citizen can feel in his or her daily life. The cost of living must go down. We must deal with the poverty crisis in the country. I've already said half the country is experiencing extreme poverty. We must deal with the fact that, uh, you know, people just simply can't afford to put food on the table. Uh, you know, we must deal with the fact that people can't afford health care and the quality quality of healthcare that's available everywhere, uh, you know, has, has plummeted. The fact that our schools, our, our education system is broken, those are the questions that we seek to answer uh, as the, the triple C. And we, we certainly are doing the heavy lifting to ensure that we are able to win six million votes uh, next uh, year, to win a two-thirds majority in, in parliament, to attain clean sweeps in local authorities, and ensure that we take power and deliver a Zimbabwe that all citizens can be proud of, that gives every single Zimbabwean citizen dignity, that ensures that you know the, the project uh, of liberation that I made reference to earlier is completed. We can't just have independence as a country, we must also have a freedom, fairness, opportunity. Everybody must participate in the national cake. Th thanks, 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 Fanzi. I think that's uh, quite, uh, quite clear. Um, I want to, we are running out of time, but I want to open for uh, anyone who wants to come in, a question, um, an input, uh, briefly to come in, just a request for the mic and um, our team, our technical team will allow you to, to come in. Um, so at least we are uh, waiting for those that may want to request to speak. Uh, Comrade Freeman. Uh, 
do we have a problem around the, the, the registration funds? It touches on that a lot and says that uh, there are issues to do with the, with the voter registration processes. What are the problems that are creating the kind of challenges that we are, we are seeing? Um, and, and, and also, I want to, to be a bit uh, 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 blunt with you. Could it be argued that uh, ZANU has uh, just done enough to retain state power? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. First, let me let me let me talk about the 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 issues of uh, registration. I think uh, people have to understand that um, previously we had that. Um, uh, the process where they went around, I think about two months ago, where they were, you know, trying to register people to vote. Uh, that was no last year, um, and we didn't have a lot of people that voted because one, first of all, um, people don't have uh, ID cards, especially those that are coming through. Um, I'm not too sure why uh, they could, you know, they can't say that, um, you know. Years ago, we used to have that green paper, the paper ID that, that you would get, a temporary ID that you get, then you can use it for everything else before you get your metal ID. I'm not too sure why now, given that people have ID numbers on their, on their birth certificates, I don't know why ZEC did not allow people to provisionally register themselves using, um, you know, either the birth certificate or a paper or temporary ID. Uh, that, that was the first thing that we saw. Secondly, ZEC distributed itself in a manner that was, um, you know, it, it, it defies logic why ZEC would have um, a single registration point uh, in a district like, um, like, like Chiri, where you have, you know, you have one, one registration point at Chile Growth Point, and yet the district has a radius of more than 60 kilometers. Now you expect people from the villages, from everywhere else, to come in and register, um, and, and you know, and that's why we had a low number even in rural areas. Now, when you look at at, at cities like Arare, the distribution at the time, you you would find that. Um, Population wise, one one registration point was actually supposed to to save a, a potential of about um, 120 new registrants, 120,000 new registrants in a radius of about uh, 20 to, to to 30 kilometers. Um, th th this was untenable. Now I see that Zeg now is doing what they are calling a blitz. Uh, they are going around now asking people to 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 register. They are saying they are going to give them um, IDs, so they are giving IDs first, and then they are going to register. Again, I want people to 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 pay attention uh, to what is happening here. It is in the best interest of Zanu PF to register people now, especially in rural areas, um, because they have realized that they are going to lose those those uh, rural areas to delimitation. That's why you see now the the push to to register people, especially in rural. areas. Now, if you go into Harare, you find that Harare is about eight hundred and something thousand, eight hundred eighty thousand registered voters. But when you do projections of people that are eligible to vote uh, in 2023, you see that we are looking at about 1.5 to 1.6 million people that are eligible to vote. Now, again, when you look at the distribution of registration areas, you you, you also realize that it's skewed towards the areas that ZANU actually wants to get more people to register. So I hope that um, the, the, the civic society and, and the opposition fraternity, when they look at this, they realize that they have the opportunity. Uh, you know, we, we did a projection again that um, if, if all the people, let's say 80% of people, that are supposed to that are eligible to vote register in Arare, Blawayo, Mutare, Gweru. Um, the opposition can win the, uh, the the presidential election. I'm talking just of the presidential election. The opposition can win the presidential election with um, if they also if they win all the urban councils 
um, and the and uh, and only two rural uh, uh, rural provinces they will be able to win the presidency if you look at the numbers. So I wish again the the opposition fraternity can put more focus on um, on getting people out to register, especially in in, in in urban areas, in areas where they have, um, you know, where 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 they, where they they have um, much, um, um, they usually win. They should go out there and and push people to to register to vote, and also try now to reduce the margins in rural areas. Now, coming to whether <laughs> uh, they have succeeded, Zania succeeded. Let me tell you something. They, I keep saying that there are four things that determine political power. Uh, one of them is uh, access to information, access to security, access to uh, control of um, the mode of production and control of finance. In information, we have managed, we have managed to fight equally with the government. That's why you realize that no one cares about the Herald anymore. No one cares about um, ZBC. Now, the the real place where the the opposition has to win is with the security. If they can manage, like we saw it and I be winning in Chukurubi, if they can manage to sway um, the security sector uh, to also create some level of comfort for change within the security sector, I believe that the elections in 2023 might be a watershed election. Thanks for that. Thanks, thanks, uh, thanks, Com. I want to quickly open uh, for the floor. I see a few people have requested uh, the mic. And so I want to start with Taona. Uh, can you quickly come in? And uh, as Taona is coming in, let's try to, uh, those who want to speak, I think request for a mic. We'll take this first round, Taona, uh, Owen, and Cephas, and then we'll take another three round, another three people, then we should be able to uh, go back to the speakers and close. Uh, unless someone will be bending to speak, uh, then we'll try and give them a chance. Uh, Tawana, are you able to speak? You are still on mute. Uh, if not, uh, Owen, can you come in? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Salo, um, my question goes to, I think I want to direct it to Fadi. Um, is it a question of registering um, more people to vote or it is a question of voter apathy? You know, um, in 2000, where MDC performed, then it was MDC or the opposition, performed well people um, turned out to vote. And uh, if you check after 2000, the other election that came in, the voter turnout was uh, low. And then uh, in 2008, we campaigned so much that people will register to vote and people should go out and vote. And um, uh, people, they really voted and the turnout was good and the performance was also good and we even won the election. And then thereafter, things goes down as well. If you check the trends of voting, uh, the performance, uh, things going good and going down. And then when things died down, we then came into 2018. We campaigned much on people to register to vote. We, we targeted uh, new voters and, and um, we performed good in 2018. So my question is, is it the question of registering people to vote? Because we still have those people who are registered to vote, who were voting for MDC before. Our numbers have gone down of people who are voting for MDC. Because before there were um, new voters or new first time first time voters that we we targeted and they voted for the opposition. Now 
we are targeting for the first timers again. And we still have those other people who are first timers now that are no longer first timers, but they vote, they register, they voter, they voted for MDC. Um, where are those people going? Where are those voters going? Because we should go Thanks, Congress Chair. I think that uh, the question is quite uh, quite clear, uh, Fazi. That um, is the diagnosis of the problem correct? Is it voter path or uh, people haven't registered to vote? I think that's uh, that's quite clear. Uh, Sifas, can you come in? Sure. Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I hope you can hear me. The loud and clear, man. Thank you. Um, I think for me, I'm picking up from what Freeman Chari uh, alluded to. I think the fact that um, we can, you know, the the triple C um, cannot win the election without um, taking seriously the rule of vote. Um, I was in Bikita over um, over the weekend, and I realized that. Um, 2023 is going to be a very interesting year in the sense that there is um there's going to be famous, most likely you know in Bikita where i was for the funeral i think there is nothing to talk about in terms of the crops there you know and i think it really broke my heart to actually realize that i think it's going to be a very key determin determinant factor come 2023 like I'm sure we know what, what has happened even over the by-elections, you know, where people were actually being given trickets, you know, so that they could, they could actually vote for the ruling parties as it were. And with the imminent um, famine or hunger that is coming, especially within the context of the rural vote, I'm not sure if uh, we can clarify in terms of the plan or there is at all a plan at all from the policy from, because we cannot talk about winning 2023 election without taking into cognizance the rule of vote and now they are faced with the hunger and uh, we know that the ruling party always uses that as a, um, as a, as a strategy to penetrate the rural um, communities as it were is there any plan uh, in place from the from the opposition to try and make sure that we possibly also can come in and do something about the hunger that is actually imminent that is imminent uh, in the uh, in this coming in this coming election that is my question thank you thanks thanks uh, sifa so i think uh, fadzi that's also quite clear with the drought that is looming uh, vote buying is likely to increase uh, does uh, the party have a way of uh, trying to minimize voter buy? Uh, trust, can you? Uh, Ineke, can you mute trust? Thank you. So, so, so I think that question was clear. Let's go to Derek. Uh, Derek, can you come in? Uh, Derek, you're on mute. I don't know. I... Hello, how are you? Hello, how are you? We can hear you. Can you yeah. please go ahead? Yeah, yeah, I'm good. I'm I'm just following the debate. I'm also someone who has been affected by by the current government, and I'm in the diaspora. And I started voting in 1999 when I was still in school, the, the first elections. But then was, subsequently things went south okay but what i think is the um is the solution is the top guys in mdc they've got safe seats in the urban areas if mr bt goes to murewa and campaign i think you have more zeal to campaign for ccc there if it goes to a rural area if mr scala goes to machingo and campaign there the problem is in the urban areas these are safe seats for the opposition no matter who you put they are safe they are very very safe seats for the opposition but if they go to the rural areas they will increase the presidential elections they may lose the the mp elections but but the fact is 
if we win the presidential elections, we now have a chance to, to govern. The urban areas are very safe. What I propose is the top 20 guys in the in the presidium, they leave those urban areas like Harare East, they've been there from, from the first time they've been, they go to the rural areas to campaign there because no one is campaigning in the rural areas. No one is he has got sorry. No, it's it's okay. Th thank you. I think the question is um is also clear. Uh Fazi, uh, some of your members are saying that uh, uh there are many other issues to be addressed, and the suggestion here is that um enough has not been done in raw areas because uh uh, the big guys are in safe seats in towns, and uh, yeah, I think that's the question. Uh, Dr. Tim? Uh, thank, thank, thank you so much. Okay, my, my question is to, to our advocate, uh, Fadzi. I've got two questions, actually. But first and foremost, I just wanted to congratulate you and all the MPs who have been sworn in today. Uh, then my first question is then, when do we expect as a party to start receiving funding from the government now that we've got uh, uh, representation in parliament? Uh, then the second question is, what's going to happen to the other remaining MPs, that are, those that are still on MDC Alliance? What is the party position? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Doc. I think uh, Fadzio noting the questions as well. Uh, the first one is, uh, uh, the second one is actually what is going to happen to the MPs. I think that are uh, still under the MDC. Before I take uh, the last uh, few people and uh, then we can close. Thank you so much, Munjodzi, um, and thank you so much to the citizens for their questions. Fadzi. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. I can hear you. Okay, great. Um, so, four questions. Uh, I see that your audio is not there. Munjodzi, uh, uh, can you help me? What's, what could be the problem? If she's able to hear us, uh, we can move to trust. I can trust. You can perfectly. you come in? <laughs> we we can perfectly hear. Um, uh, but um, I think she may continue. I'm so much No, no, it's okay. Sorry, sorry, trust. I think I'm told that Fadi is speaking. It's only me who can't hear. So please go ahead, Fadi. Okay, so four questions have been raised by uh, the citizens, and I'm going to deal with each of the questions in turn. Firstly, Owen asked a question whether it's a question of registering more people to vote or managing the apathy. Now, uh, and he went back to 2000 and cited quite a few examples, 2000, 2005, 2008, and so on. Now, you all recall that a new voters' role completely, uh, a biometric voters' role was created in 2018 or for the 2018 election. And that required citizens to all vote for the same, for the first time. So we can't even go back to the old voter rolls that were there before we deal uh, as a starting point with what was there in 2018. And of course, it's important to ensure that everybody who voted in 2018 votes, but the data tells us that these votes will not be enough to give us the landslide that we, we require. So there is really need to capitalize uh, on the citizens who have attained or will attain, attain the age of 18 uh, by election day uh, for the purposes of a clear victory in 2023, one that won't lead to a disputed election. So in answer to Owen, I'm going to say that we absolutely need to register millions more people, and there's a lot of work to be done, a lot of work by the triple C, by civic society, by citizens themselves. We simply have to engage very strongly on this issue. And then once those people are registered, once they're eligible to vote, we have to then do the heavy lifting of winning their hearts, winning their minds, so that they not only vote on election day, 
but they also vote for transformation. They vote for the triple C. So both those things need to be done. The data tells us that these two can't be separated. We can't only bank uh, on the, the people who are registered thus far. We have to go beyond that. We have to go and fish, uh, you know, in the young uh, vote pond. We have to, you know, make sure that we win even those who were previously zanu uh, or disillusioned. We have to win every single vote we can uh, to ensure that we win Zimbabwe for change in 2023. Which takes me to the second question which was raised by CFAS around the rural vote. Now, it's absolutely fundamental that we tap very strongly into uh, the rural vote, um, not just because rural people must be manipulated, you know, for winning elections, but because the crisis in rural Zimbabwe is one that is chronic and it is stark. The level of underdevelopment is hugely uh, concerning, and that's something that we wish to tackle. So we have said time and again that no citizen, rural or urban, will be left behind uh, in the in the in the you know road to 2023. Uh, we don't just want their votes, but we also want to champion their issues very strongly. Now, on the suggestion that maybe we provide our own food so that we buy votes, you know, vote buying is unlawful. You know, there is no way uh, the Triple C is going to try and compete uh, with ZANU PF to, 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 you know, buy votes using food. It, it's not only unsustainable, but it's unlawful and wrong politics. The electoral playing field must be free and fair, and there has to be reform in the area of vote buying. Uh, and this is something that we've raised time and again with the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission, and it's one of our top agenda items when it comes to the, the reform uh, you know, arena, where we say vote buying must stop because it can't be a contest of who can buy the most soap, who can buy the most maize. It should be a contest of ideas, you know, policies, who's going to, uh, you know, provide a better Zimbabwe for, for the citizens. And obviously, we have said time and again that the money that buys food for citizens is taxpayer money. It's money that is uh, that belongs to the citizens. It should not be abused by any political party for political gain. Uh, even the humanitarian aid that and agencies, whether they're domestic or foreign, to say that, look, you have to make sure that you manage the distribution process. And that's where the plan lies. The strategy is around ensuring that whatever aid uh, is, is, is brought in is not abused and weaponized for electoral gain. Which takes me to the third question raised by uh, Derek. Uh, Derek has said that, well, the top leaders uh, contest for safe seats in rural areas. Now, in response to this issue that was raised, I, I want to make a number of things categorically uh, clear. Number one, the Triple C is a brand new movement. President Chamisa said time and again that the old leadership that existed in the MDC is no longer the leadership that is there. Even I, uh, even though I'm speaking to you now, I'm doing so in a caretaker position. So it's open season for every single position. It's the communities using our new model of community consensus candidate selection that are going to choose who, who, who's going to represent them, whether it's a constituency level or at ward level. Now, as the Triple C, one of the, the key philosophies that guides us is that it's the citizens that must come first. It's not about us, you know, uh, you know, those at the top or those who perceive themselves at the top coming up with an elite pact and, you know, being patronizing to communities and saying, you know, Mahere, you should run in some constituency in Chikomba because you come from there. What do the citizens there want? Who lives there? Who is able to champion the issues that are there? That is the model of candidate selection we're going for. It's not a question of us handpicking and saying, you know, Mahere, you go here, uh, BT, you go there. That's not how it's going to work this time around. The game has changed completely. The citizens. So if you come from X constituency, if you come from whether it's Mount Pleasant, whether it's Chiwi, you as the citizen are going to decide. If you from Chibi decide that my head is the one and she's willing and she's available, then that's that. 
but it's the citizens who are going to decide. And the model we want is one that's centered around citizen-focused ethical leadership. We don't want absentee MPs, people who abuse a constituency just to get a seat, and then they're never there. They don't live among, they don't hear from uh, the people, they don't meet the people, they don't engage with the people. It's not just about saying this is a big name, let's plonk it there. That's not how this model is going to work. And, you know, you'll be shocked. You think, I think one of the big opportunities that exists uh, with the creation of the Triple C is that we're opening up the plane. It's not going to be the same traditional names you've heard time and again. We want new blood in. We want the citizens, we want you to pick people from your communities to represent you. Now I come to the last issue raised by uh, Dr. Tim. He asked a two-pronged question. Firstly, now that we are elected, will we get funding from government? Um, now, all the evidence suggests that we're not going to get any funding from government because the, the allocation has already been made uh, this year uh, for, for the allocation and so on. But obviously, our lawyers are exploring whether there's anything that's going to be available for next year. And that's something that will be communicated in due course. Um, and then the second question was around the other remaining MPs. What, what is the strategy there? Now, the, the, the guiding philosophy, as I've uh, said time and again, of the Triple C is that we respect the will of the people. It's the citizens that come first. And the citizens' will must always be respected. Now, if citizens voted for X MP, who are we to patronize that and say the person you voted for should no longer be in parliament. If that person was respected and voted for by the people, that person should continue. And obviously, uh, as I've said time and again, the people know who their leaders are. There's no confusion around who uh, belongs to the, the, the Grand Citizens Movement, to the Triple C. Every, everyone's clear around that. So because we operate, obviously, in very extraordinary times where, you know, there's been this... Um, illegitimacy crisis that's tainted not only the, the, the presidency, but also spilled into parliament. We are in very unusual circumstances where the ordinary circumstances don't apply. Uh, we've been forced into this situation by, you know, a, a, a coterie of people who simply have no respect for the will of the citizens. But obviously that's going to change in 2023 and, you know, pursuant to the general election of 2023, our goal is to ensure that you've got a two-thirds yellow majority in Parliament so that none of this confusion uh, uh, continues. It, it will all be clear. And I think President Chamisa has said time and again that there will be no confusion. And I just want to re reiterate, uh, you know, based on a question that was asked earlier, that the, 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 the key action that has to be taken in 2022 as we prepare for 2023 is electoral reform. The region has to be on board with this agenda. You know, the, the, the governance, the bad governance crisis in Zimbabwe is spilling everywhere. It's spilling into South Africa, it's spilling into Botswana, it's spilling into Zambia. You know, and so every single jurisdiction has an interest in ensuring that there is not another disputed election in Zimbabwe that will lead to another illegitimate regime. It's, it's become an issue that has to be prioritized by all players, local and domestic, to ensure that we win Zimbabwe for change. Sorry, Munjodi. Uh, thanks, oh, thanks, Fadzi. Uh, <laughs> I was having a problem of hearing you the last uh, few sentences, but thanks for for clarifying some of the questions that are coming up. I want to ask the last uh, input uh, from Sasha, uh, unless if we have someone else who hasn't spoken who requests the mic. Uh, Sasha, you will have the, the last input. Can you come in? Sasha, you're on mute. Uh, good evening. Hello. Hello. Yeah, audible, Sasha. You may proceed. Yes. Um, I've just got one thing. I'm. I've always kind of like been worried about. I always. I come from Bulawayo, and I've realized that a lot of youth in Bulawayo, when I talk to them over the phone and things, they are not really. There's still this division. 
I feel like maybe there has been efforts, I can tell. There has been efforts to kind of like uh, make the Ndebele population feel included as well. But I think a lot more can be done. I'm not going to mention names of other higher people in Triple C that I think are a bit less vocal, as I would put it, in trying to governize like um, the Bulawayo and Matepelele and at great like uh, population to go and register to vote. Because a lot of people seem to be really not interested in a sense. They, they're not convinced that there's going to be any change. I've spoken to about two or three people that keep saying the same thing, like, what will change? And I'm always like, no, this is different. If MTC fails, now there's triple C, it's a new baby, it's going to work. So I feel like, please, can we do a lot more work on the ground in Matepelele and, and Bulawayo especially? That's what I have to say. Thank you so much. Um, with your permission, may I please come in? You may proceed, Fadzi. Thank you. Uh, Sasha, thank you very much. Uh, you, you raise a very important issue and one that's obviously very close to our hearts. The one of um, unifying Zimbabwe with all its um, creeds, with all its races, with all its tribes, with all its, uh, you know, diversity. You know, every citizen must be included, which is why we said that the only qualifier to join the Triple C is that one is a citizen of Zimbabwe and is interested in the goal of ensuring that there is a better Zimbabwe for all. Now, I just want to make it abundantly clear that when the Triple C wins, everybody wins because this is this thing belongs to the citizens. It doesn't belong to President Nelson Chamisa. It doesn't belong to any. I, I'm not sure who you have in mind when you said some of the top leaders, but certainly, you know, it doesn't belong to any elites. Uh, you know, it, it is a thing that belongs to the people you know it 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 is a, a a movement that you should feel every right to take full ownership of if you are sick and tired of a particular councillor in Luveve or in any part of Ulawa, if you're tired of your MP in Ulawa or South or whichever region, you now have an opportunity to make your voice heard. Obviously, I'm very pleased to report that we had a clean sweep, um, in fact, clean sweeps in Ulawa or in the by-election, but that doesn't mean that the room for improvement can't be filled. A lot more work needs to be done, but it's not a question of saying, well, President Chamisa, you throw yourself in front of a, an army tank and save us. We all have a responsibility you know my own personal philosophy is that you if you want to see change in the political space you have to be the change you wish to see we all have a responsibility it's not a question of sitting at home and tweeting and saying you know my herimanya kuma rural areas while you sit back and do nothing we have a collective responsibility we all have to participate that's the only way this thing is going to work and not only should people uh, register to vote and vote, but people must also step up to participate. When the call is made for candidate selection, offer yourself up if you believe you've got the skills and the competence. We want as many, we want to see the strongest parliament we've ever seen in 2023 in terms of competence, people who are engaged, people who are clued up on the issues, people who participate uh, within their communities and offer a convening platform uh, for their communities to develop, people who are constantly making sure that citizen issues are front and center in the political discourse. We can't have a political discourse that's dominated by issues to do with personalities and positions. No, we want the daily struggles that we face as citizens to be front and center. I think, in fact, I know and I believe that the Triple C offers us as citizens, I'm speaking now as a citizen, not as the caretaker spokesperson of the movement, that it really is a chance for us to say, look, this is the kind of politics that we want. You know, if you're in Mount Pleasant as, as, as I am, Mount Pleasant constituency, you say, look, this is how I want things to be done in this constituency. If you uh, come from Luveve, if you come from Kulumani, if you come from Zilikazi, wherever it is, Put your stake, put your issues on the table. If you don't champion your issues, no one is coming from anywhere to save us. We don't want to replicate the toxic politics of the past where we relinquish as citizens our power to just a few people because we know that absolute power 
Power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely, which is why we want disparate power, the citizen, the power to be diffused amongst the people and the people to always hold each and every person who offers them up to lead to account. It doesn't matter that the person you're holding to account is from triple C, that's our obligation. If they're not coming back to the people, Put, take them to task. If they're not acting with integrity, take them to task. If they're acting uh, in a corrupt way, remove them. That is the kind of politics that's going to take Zimbabwe out of the quagmire it finds itself in. And this is not just to Lawayo, it's to every single province, whether you're in Manika land, in Mashingo province, in Mashana land, in wherever you are, please let's take responsibility as citizens. We've been given like an open penalty where we can take it and say, look, this is our chance to drive social change. Let's do all the needful to ensure that we win as Zimbabwe for change. I hope that answers you, Sasha. Uh, thank you so much, Fadzia. I think that's, uh, that's quite clear. And uh, I think that brings us to the end of this, um, uh, this dialogue uh, on spaces. And uh, I think the issues that are coming out are quite clear uh, that our electoral or Zimbabwe's electoral environment uh, is problematic at the moment. There is a lot of work to be done between now and the 2020, the government, the political parties, the main parties, particularly ZANPF and uh, what now emerges as the CCC to be uh, the main parties. Um, the civil society players, uh, ZESNI, ERC, and many other uh, organizations that have been working to try and ensure that we uh, build a more perfect democracy. Uh, because I think that uh, democracy, when it uh, produces the will of the people, it is a perfect thing, it is a good thing. Uh, it uh, allows people to really have confidence in the processes that uh, unfold in their countries and people support things. And it's easy to develop when there is less conflict and less contestation of outcomes of elections. So as part of what I said in the beginning, CELO will continue to put these dialogues together to bring people to try and uh, build on uh, democratic practices, but also to try and uh, build consensus among people, uh, share some of the problems. I know that tonight we have heard uh, more about the problems. Uh, in some spaces, we'll focus on uh, the solutions, what has to be done moving forward. Uh, and I want to thank the speakers, but before I do that, I see that Ellen uh, is back in. And Ellen, I know that... Uh, yeah, technology is always a challenge. Uh, this is the downside of it, uh, rather than physical meetings. But I want you to have two, three minutes of just summing up your input, but also give your closing remarks, uh, I think, on what you guys are seeing and your expectations for the 2023 elections and uh, your final word. Thank you, our moderator, and apologies for the technology hiccup. Um, actually, I don't know what, uh, what, what you did here because I kept on talking. <laughs> so I don't know what, uh, what uh, way I, I, I was uh, booted out uh, at which stage. So I think, um, like you rightly said, uh, there's need also to continue with these discussions and uh, other platforms and spaces where we can speak about what needs to be done, probably by who. But like I indicated, if you had that part when I was talking about the need for, for regional bodies like African Union, uh, SADAC, to also help us as Zimbabwean civic society, political parties push for electoral reforms before 2023. In particular, we want them to uh, to push for the recommendations that they offered in their reports that should be implemented by the different stakeholders, including ZEC, government, political parties, civic society, media, uh, so that our 2023 elections are better. And uh, I also had indicated that it's not um, good for these observer missions to come uh, and observe our elections and proffer the same recommendations 
from the previous uh, elections. So we really need to challenge them to also engage with the government, with ZEC and key stakeholders, and discuss ways of implementing their. Then uh, probably maybe also my recommendations to political parties to continue uh, uh, political parties and civic society to ensure that there's a robust provision of information to the communities and uh, uh, key uh, stakeholders, the citizens for, for, for political parties, the supporters about the key electoral processes such as voter registration. I think it's one thing to have a, a, a rally with thousands of people and don't have uh, supporters voting for you on election day. So there's need for robust mechanisms of ensuring that those who attend political rallies are also registered so that they can participate and they can vote for the political parties of their choice. The statistics uh, released by Zek, I think today or yesterday, I can't remember, but I saw them on Twitter. I think there's clear indication that there's appetite from the youth to register. The numbers are clear that there are more youth that registered in the in the just um, the phase one BVR blitz process. So we need to continue uh, pushing uh, the youth and also women, people with disabilities, to also go out in numbers and register and take advantage of the current civil registry blitz uh, to get their identity documents as uh, youth and also as citizens of Zimbabwe. Then my other. Um, Contain that probably we can discuss uh, uh, at another stage, Munjodzi, um, is around the need for also civil society and political parties in particular to demand clear uh, procedures or clear uh, regulations, rather, so that these are, um, uh, there's, there's, a, a, there's a clear policy and, and law around the delimitation process. In particular, on the issue of engagement, um, Zek uh, has indicated that they'll be engaging citizens, but we don't know what kind of engagement in terms of mechanisms that they will employ during this process. And uh, we need also to educate citizens about the process so that they can engage meaningfully in the delimitation process. It's one of the key electoral processes that we also need to have oversight as political parties, as civil society, as citizens of Zimbabwe. I think I uh, remember Freeman in his uh, contribution spoke about the need to ensure that uh, the, the, the boundaries are, are, demarc are demarcated in a way that is satisfactory and that also is acceptable by all uh, political parties and also, also all citizens, in particular in constituencies where we have high numbers of registered voters like Arare South uh, and Epweb. I think we also have Dangambura among others. So we also need to ensure that citizens can meaningfully participate, taking note of the key political and key technical considerations, and uh, also Zek ensuring that Zek also employs the issue of uh, the limitation principles uh, in terms of transparency and also in ensuring that they engage with uh, the different stakeholders. Um, there are quite a number of issues that we can speak about when it comes to elections, but I think for now I'll end here. And just want to thank you, uh, Salo, for this platform. And we hope to engage with you in future as well. Thank you so much. Back to you, over. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. Uh, thank you so much. And you point to a number of areas that people need to focus on. And uh, again, thank you both, Freeman and Fadzi, for, for, for your remarks earlier. Uh, Freeman, your last word. Hey, thank you. Um, thank you so much for this space, and I really appreciate people that have come to listen to us. Uh, <laughs> there, there are a few things that I just want to say. There is a hierarchy of responsibilities. Uh, we have the responsibilities that we, you know, that we have been given as citizens. Um, that is the responsibility to register to vote, the responsibility to show up to vote, and the responsibility to protect our vote and to secure it. I also want to say to the political parties, um, you, you, you also have responsibilities that are really fundamental. Re remember, you, you are the custodian of people's hopes at this point. And, and therefore, ensure that one, you deliver on the promise that um, you, know, you are going to build an institution that is inclusive, that is um, representative, uh, that is also you know, ready to, to, to 
to participate in the elections. Let not the issues that we have raised before, the issues that have bedeviled you before, again, be the ones that um, that, that come up in, in, in 2023. Uh, we, we also hope that because of this hierarchy of responsibilities, citizens are wearing spectacles. But we hope that in political parties and in um, civic society, there are people with binoculars and there are people with the telescopes. The people with the telescopes should be seen further away and they should be proffering solutions to impending issues that they are seeing that the ordinary citizen is not seeing. Not that on the day of elections or after the election, we have uh, the political party and the civic society have the same problems and they have the, you know don't have this, the solutions just as the ordinary person on the street. Let's plan ahead, let's fix, let's provide solutions. And, and you know we can win this if we really think deeply about how we can um, you know, uh, mitigate the the challenges that we we are facing. Thank you so much. I appreciate. Uh, thank you, thank you, Freeman uh, Fadzi. Thank you so much, Munjotsi. I think all that remains is for me to really thank uh, the citizens and everybody who stepped up to the plate to participate in one way or the other. We are living uh, in, a, a, like I said, a sophisticated dictatorship. It's not easy uh, to be a politician in this environment. It's not easy to give money if you're a citizen, whether you're in the diaspora within Zimbabwe, it's not easy to stand as a polling agent, it's difficult to be a candidate, but we really are seeing a huge pull by the citizens to really converge, come together and really do their best uh, despite the odds and in very difficult circumstance. And I think uh, the results that we've seen in just the last two months really bode well for the future. Of course, we're not naive to the enormity of the task that lies ahead. And I think I'm happy to see Ellen Shiriedenga here. She really is doing amazing work within the elections directress. And I think she was the one I have to point out who, uh, you know, did the, the the heavy lifting of getting the voters role from ZEC and making sure that it could be available uh, just so that the, 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 we could all work together to ensure that it's come through. And I know that our lawyers are as well working around the clock on a volunteer basis to ensure that solutions are found. And again, it's not as though uh, everything works in a straight line. I think I'll, I'll stop there. Suffice it to say that we have a goal 2023 together. And our collective goal, citizens, is that we have to ensure that we obtain 6 million votes in the presidential election, a two-thirds majority in parliament, and clean sweeps in the local authorities. We all must ensure we play our part in this. If you've got a special skill, please offer yourself up. And I really have to thank all of those who've uh, volunteered in one way or the other, the web developers, the graphic designers, the lawyers, the uh, data analysts, lots of people, communications experts, consultants are all coming up and offering their services. Let's continue to do that uh, again so that we, we all make sure that the, the machine is ready and well-oiled for uh, 2022. I know I speak for President Chamisa and the entirety of the movement when I say the future is bright, the future is exciting, uh, the Triple C is our only best forward as citizens uh, to win Zimbabwe for change. So let's all make sure uh, we participate. Apathy is simply not an option available to us because, uh, like I said, if the Triple C wins, we all win. If the Triple C loses, we all lose. The poverty will continue, the injustice, the bad leadership. Let's all participate and make sure we do our part. And not to forget, of course, um, the region, SADC, uh, you also have a responsibility as, uh, you know, international institutions and the international community uh, that is, is, is closest to us. You have a responsibility to hold Mr. Mnangagwa to account. You know, SADC has a treaty, um, 
around how human rights must be uh, respected. Uh, SADC has election guidelines that bind all its members. This is clear as a matter of, uh, you know, international law. So we're not asking the region to do anything that's outside its mandate. We obviously are fully aware that none but ourselves will rescue ourselves, but you must at that, uh, you know, regional level ensure that SADC is doing what's necessary to ensure all of its members, and in this case, especially Zimbabwe, is complying what, with the, 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 the rules that the club has set for how elections must be conducted. The election field must be fair, free, uh, and uh, undisputed. We must ensure that the constitution is complied with. We cannot have a shambolic voters' role, and we're going to use all tools available to us. We're going to use the law, but political means as well. We're going to use political pressure. We're going to use our rights set out in Section 59 of the constitution to ensure that we put pressure on ZEC uh, so that in 2023 we have the historic election with the results that all citizens uh, can. And be proud of a result that is a true expression of the will of the people. And someone just asked, uh, you know, previously that, you know, ZANU looks like it's winning. Well, their posture is not the posture uh, of a body that is winning. It's the posture of an outfit that's scared stiff, that's insecure, that's declared war on the citizens and is now going for broke with violence. If they believed that they could win a free and fair election, they would not resort to all these dirty tricks you know, vote buying, weaponizing food aid, abusing the courts, abusing state institutions, abusing the police. We are going to ensure that in 2023, the will of the people prevails. Thank you so much, Salo, for having us today. And we will continue uh, to participate in these conversations and also ensure that we use all tools available to us to champion the cause of electoral reform. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fadzi, for coming to the platform, but also for your insights into this topic. Uh, thank you, Freeman. Thank you, Ellen. Unfortunately, uh, Solo couldn't join us because he was driving and I think he kept losing network. But all the same, we want to thank him for uh, choosing to join us. Um, all that's left is for me to thank everyone who is here. And before I do that, uh, I just want to say that as I said earlier, the lessons are quite clear from the by-election. There are many challenges that are there. Zimbabwe has been going through these problems uh, for the past decade, at the very uh, for the past two decades at the very least. And uh, obviously, Fadzi and Freeman sum it properly when they say that uh, we need to play our role as citizens. Each one has to do all they can so that we can take uh, this country forward and uh, build in a democracy that respects the will of the people. Uh, thank you all for coming. I want to ask my colleague Louis Loazi to, to give a vote of thanks. Well, thank you, Commander Rosie. You, you've basically summarized uh, our vote of thanks, but fundamentally, this dialogue show, uh, shows us that there, there, there's a long road to be traveled. There is a glimmer of hope, though, as citizens' voices are slowly but surely gaining traction and people are receiving. Thank you so much, our viewers and listeners. Uh, this is Teresa uh, live here on Change Radio. Uh, we had this conversation is your college, uh, Fazai Mahere. Uh, we were discussing the 26th March by election and the preparation for the uh, 2023 watershed uh, ele general election. So um, we have come to the end of this program. Thank you so much for tuning in. I say to you, have a good time. Uh, good night. Thank you so much for coming uh, through. Uh, please join us. We have more programs coming. I uh, will be here with you. Thank you so much. Bye. <laughs>